me put the recording on okay <laughs> we're recording um now we're we're to the end of second corinthians now and we're in the last chapter second corinthians 13 um where we were at in second corinthians 12 it's carrying over remember when we finished up uh chapter 12 we were talking about that Paul wanted to come and see them again. He wanted to address, and he enumerated some of the sins that were problematic, that were going on in the church at Corinth. Well, chapter 13 probably shouldn't have even been broken off as chapter 13. It probably should have just been a continuance of chapter 12, because the topic is still the same. He's still talking about the visit. He's still talking about those same issues. He's still talking about the, the things that need to be addressed in this upcoming visit. Some would say, well, wait a minute, did Paul actually go to Corinth three times? Or did he only go two times? Well, actually he did go three times. Uh, biblically, we have background for that. Um, if you go into Acts like verses one through 18, uh, he talks about his first two visits. And then in two verses in Acts chapter 20, verses two and three, he talks about a third visit, but that's it. It's a, it, he doesn't explain what he did. He doesn't explain what came across, but it's possible that he's talking about his visit in AD around 57, 57 AD, when he would have come. So it's in that visit, he would have addressed the issues that he had talked about here in Second Corinthians. Because in 60 AD, he was put in jail, okay? Basically, remember he had, he took the ship, uh, remember how they ended up in that storm, right? Ended up on Malta for a couple months, for a month or two, and then he ended up going to Rome where he was put in house arrest because he had, he had claimed Caesar. He wanted to go to Caesar because he didn't want the Jews to be the ones to judge him on these issues. He says, so I, I, what's the word he used? I, not I claim Caesar, but I something Caesar. And since he was a Roman citizen, he had the right to do that. Oh, I appeal to Caesar was the word he used. I appeal to Caesar. And so he says that unto Caesar, you shall go. And that's what he did. He went to Caesar. Now he was in jail for uh, house arrest, we don't know how long, but the understanding is, is that he was in house arrest for a while, that he was released before he ended up going into that dungeon arrest, like he was arrested and put in the dungeon, and then from there, that's when he was martyred, okay, he was killed. Um, so there's a belief that there was a period between the time he was in house arrest and the time that he went into the dungeon that he may have gone places. We don't have anything to justify it. There's a lot of speculation and if indeed he did get released and if indeed he did go. And if you remember in Romans, he talks about wanting to go and preach to the people in what we call Spain today. Did he ever make it there? Some believe he did but we don't have anything to really give us full justification other than he had asked the Romans to help him to get there. You know, if he had the opportunity to get over so that he could preach to them and give them the good news. So we don't know. We just know that we're talking about the church at Corinth. We're talking about the third visit. And so some believe that he may have visited Corinth between that time frame, like when he was in house arrest before he got arrested that second time and then was thrown into the dungeon and just before his death. And his death would have been around 65, 66 AD. So th th those are questions we probably won't have answered this side of eternity. But the reality is, is that, hey, it was something Paul wanted to do. He wanted to get out there. He wanted to preach the gospel. He made that clear. He, and, and that's what Jesus had ordained him to do and was commissioning and commissioned him to do was to go preach to the Gentiles, right? What did they sentence Paul with to death? Uh, well, the first time he, he appealed to Caesar 
if you remember, because the Jews had claimed that he had blasphemed, he had done things that were against Jewish law, kind of like with Jesus. And they had turned him over to the Roman authorities. He had gotten arrested and they wanted to kill him um, because, well, for one thing, he was a turncoat, right? He was a Pharisee and all of a sudden now he's going after Jesus. So they saw him as a threat, the, the Sanhedrin did. And they wanted him dead. So that's why they had accused him as starting a riot in the temple, if you remember. Um, he had gone to the temple to offer help for these people that were finishing their vows. Well, then they had somebody start a ruckus in the temple saying he had taken Gentiles into the Jewish portion of the temple. And so they wanted to kill him right then and there. So they took him in. Um, and, and they tried him and on, he ended up staying in jail like for two years. And all of a sudden this other guy comes and is, uh, takes over up there in, uh, Caesarea. And so he's gonna, then he gets tried by that guy and that guy wanted to release him, but he said, Hey, let, let's let, let's go take you back to Jerusalem and let them judge you. And he said, no, 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 I'm not going back there to them. Basically, they're going to lie anyway. So he says, I appeal to Caesar. So was there anything really bad? No, it was all religious semantics is basically what he was charged with and why he ended up going to Rome the first time. Now, the second time, the time that he went, and that's when he went to Rome and was put in house arrest. He was waiting to talk to Caesar and basically, you know, let him know his case but the second time the part where he's in the dungeon in other words i don't know if that was just a sequential thing like all of a sudden a new caesar came in because caesar augustus uh wasn't the one that ended up killing like jews and christians and that kind of thing it was that it was caesar it was another Caesar, and it just slips my mind right now. But he's the one. Huh? Oh, Nero. He's the one that burnt Rome and then blamed it on the Christians. You know, he himself had Rome burnt, you know. And so he's the one that, that started killing Christians. He's the one that had Paul thrown into the dungeon. And he's the one then that killed both Peter and Paul, along with Christians, too. I mean, but those, those two were killed by Nero. Because he came out with a vengeance against Christians. So that's that was the whole issue, you know, with that. Does that explain it, Gene? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, Paul, you know, he loved the Lord. And he really wanted to get the word of God out, regardless of the consequences that he was going to experience or expect. He just wanted to get the word of God out. Well, and that's what he's doing with Corinth here is he loves them. He really wants them to grow in the Lord, but they're waffling, they're mm -hmm. sinning, they're doing what they want to do instead of really coming down to following the Lord the way Paul wants them to. The way Paul has given them the good news and the direction to follow, they still want to do things their way. It's kind of like they want to mix and match their culture and and add Jesus in there with the way that their culture is going so that they can have it, in, you know, basically they can have it the Burger King way, right? <laughs> and that was kind of the, the, the mindset in Corinth. So this is where we're going to go. That's kind of the intro, but then we're going to see that Paul picks up saying the same thing that he was closing out chapter 12 with, okay? Okay, any questions on the intro? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together and study your word. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just give us insight, open up our hearts and minds, that we may understand your word, but more than anything, that we would put it into practice in a way that honors you and brings you glory. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's take a look here and see what we got going okay so he ends up talking about uh as you can see the subtitle talks about final warnings uh but let's go down here a little bit 
let's see if I can go down a little bit um, uh, through whom I sent. Have you been thinking all along, been defending ourselves to you? It is in the sight of God as I'm speaking. Okay, yeah, here is where he says in verse 14 and verse 12, here for the third time, I am ready to come to you and I will not be a burden for I seek not what is yours, but you. In other words, I'm coming for you guys to help you guys out, okay? That's what he says in, in verse 14 of chapter 12. And then when we get down to chapter 13, look what he says. He says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. So now he's repeating it again. This is the third time I'm coming to you. So that's what I was talking about in the intro. He, he, he's going to come again. And everything that he had mentioned, remember he had mentioned some charges up in chapter 12 where he was talking, look at what he said here in verse 20. For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, in other words, walking in Christ's righteousness, and that you may find me not as you wish, in other words, it want this, this eloquent, you know, really polished individual that was coming with a bunch of uh, good philosophy and stuff. And he says that perhaps there may be, look at what he says that he, he's already heard and knows he's probably going to find when he gets there. That perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. I fear that when I come again, my God may humble me before you, and I may have to mourn over many of those who sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual immorality, and sensuality that they have practiced. So there's a lot of problematic issues that aren't reflecting a holy walk with the Lord, right? I mean, they've got some serious, serious issues. And there are, apparently, there are many in the church that are allowing these things to happen. So understanding that, now we can go in here and understand what he's talking about. He says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. And now he's, he's, he's saying, how are we going to address these sins that we've been talking about? Every charge, in other words, to everyone where these sins are problematic and people aren't repentant from them, he's saying every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. So when I come to you, don't just be pointing the finger at people. Make sure that there are witnesses where we can address these things in terms of church discipline in a proper way. That it's not just somebody, uh, he or she said, but the reality is that it's, it's evidence in their lives and their witnesses about it. And these witnesses are living in a righteous way. Okay. So he's saying these are issues that need to be addressed. You can't just let them be happening in the church and act as if everything's fine. Like, remember when we were in First Corinthians, that man that was living with his mother-in-law and having, you know, relations with her and they were allowing it? Well, that's the same issue that he's addressing here. They've got these sins going on and nobody's, you know, taking action against them and addressing them in the right way in the way Jesus calls, you know, for people to address these things in the church body, to hold people accountable for these things, to bring these things to bear, not, not to hammer them, but so that they will come to repentance. But if they don't come to repentance, there's a proper way of following procedure to where then, hey, you may end up having to excommunicate them for a while until they can come back to the right path and walking with the Lord in the right way, not in a sinful way. If indeed they ever accepted Jesus in the first place, right? So look at verse two. He says, I warned those who sinned before and all the others. In other words, hey, this isn't the first time I'm telling you this, guys. And I warned them now while absent, as I did when present on my second visit, that if I come again, I will not spare them. In other words, hey, this is something, when I came, I've already addressed these issues with you. I've explained, I've identified problems, we've addressed them, we've done things about them, but now, why is this still going on? Obviously, when I come again, you're not going to be pleased with me coming, because I'm not going to come quietly, I'm going to come this time to address these things in a way that you probably aren't going to like. 
But it's important because if we don't address them, all we're doing is we're damaging the body of Christ. We're causing divisions within the body of Christ. We're allowing sin within the body of Christ as if it, it's okay. And these are not acceptable types of situations or conditions within the body of Christ because it, it divides the body of Christ. It doesn't bring people together. And sin is not something that we should be practicing and living in. It's something that we should realize, yes, we have grace for forgiveness, but it's, grace is not an excuse or a license to keep on sinning just because, hey, well, I can sin and ask for forgiveness right after it, and hey, everything's good to go. It's not that type of thing. Jesus died for a reason. He died to forgive our sin, but not so that we would continue to live in that sin with a license like, well, Jesus paid the price, so I can do anything I want. And unfortunately, there were many in the church of Corinth that were kind of looking at it that way. And we see that even in the church of Rome, they had problems like that, because we saw that Paul even, you know, was strong in chapter 6 of Romans in verse 1 against them, where he said, eh, should we sin all the more so that grace all the more can abound? God forbid. So they were trying to use, you know, the grace of Jesus's death on the cross as a license to sin all the more. Well, obviously, Corinth is dealing with this same type of issue. And so Paul is not pleased with it. He's coming back to him, and he wants them to understand that, hey, he's going to address it in very strong terms, whether they like it or not, whether they accept him for it or not, he's going to address it in those terms. So he says in verse 3, since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, this is, he, he finishes up that statement with that, because remember we were, I was talking earlier in earlier chapters where he was defending why he had the right to be telling them these things, not the least of which that he is one of the apostles, and not the least of which he's the one that God sent to plant the church there in Corinth, but that he needed to be there because that's what God was putting on his heart for him to do. It wasn't something that he wanted to do just because it's like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a tyrant over you. But he's saying, I'm doing it because I love you, because I care about you, and I want you to be walking in Christ's righteousness, not according to the world and its standards. You've got to come out of the world. You've got to be who Christ wants you to be. And you need to model Christ Otherwise, how's the world going to know that you're Christians if you're living no different than they are? And in many cases, you're probably living even worse than they are. Like he told that man, you know, or like he told the church about that man that was living with his mother-in-law. He said, not even the Gentiles do that, or they don't even consider that something that's acceptable practice. He says, that's wrong. Come on, people. Come out of that sin. So that's why he's saying, uh, you since you seek proof that Christ is speaking in me, saying, I will show you, as I've shown you before, I, I don't come of my own volition in the sense I'm going to fix things, but I come because God sends me to you, Christ sends me to you, to get you back on track. And we, we come, and I say we, because it's Paul and Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, that come so that they can build up the church, not tear it down. But to fix the problems in it, they have to address it where the problems are, at the root of each issue. And that is in holding accountable those people that are living in sin and saying, it's okay, not a problem. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm fine. I'm good. But that's not acceptable. Not if they're living in that sin as a practice and saying it's all okay. And that's what Paul is talking about. So any questions so far on that? And does that look any different than some of the problems we have in our churches today? Yeah, pretty much same kind of issues, aren't they? So we see that, you know, God does the work through Paul. Paul is always very focused on that. He's saying, look, everything that I do, I do what God wants me to do. Remember how he wanted to go to a certain place to preach? He wanted to go to this one district, and God, he says the Holy Spirit forbade him from going there. But then he had a dream of somebody up in Macedonia calling him, and he, then he understood that was where 
God wanted him to go. Well, that's how Paul worked. Paul worked by God's direction and where he would go. And he was also very concerned. Man, every time you read his letters, you can find that he, he loves the believers. And he's always praying for them in whatever churches. He always wants the best for them. Well, that's what he wants to for the church at Corinth. But they just seem to have this kind of willy-nilly kind of attitude like, hey, you know, we want to take advantage of our culture too. you know, live in our culture and be accepted by people of the world. And we want to have all this and we want to have our church. And well, don't get so nitty picky about all the regulations and the rules of following Christ. It's just, you know, hey, we can have both. We're fine. Don't worry about it. Well, Paul's saying, no, 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 you can't serve two masters, right? That's what it comes down to. So he says that Christ is speaking in me since you seek proof. Well, he is. Now he says he, that's Christ, is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. So in other words, look, just because I come and I'm the one that brings, you know, this message to you. Remember in 1 Corinthians 11, remember that scripture where it talks, you know, how when we have communion, usually they'll read out of that scripture, uh, you know, as an intro to having communion, right? Well, remember what it says, that if you, t if you take of the bread and the wine or of the blood and the body inappropriately, he said that that's why many of you sleep today. That wasn't a euphemism. Uh, well, maybe it was a euphemism, but what it means is that, hey, some of you, uh, the Lord has taken you because you're in a sin or something, and he's just come and take you. That's why you sleep now, okay? So that wasn't, that it shouldn't have necessarily had to be that way, but because you're in sin and you're taking these elements and making it seem like it's okay, I mean, you're, you're testing the Lord. And so that's why he says, and some of you sleep today. In other words, some of you are dead now because you took of those elements inappropriately before the Lord in a sacrilegious way. Thank God he doesn't do that today because otherwise we'd have a lot of, you know, Christians petering out right there in church, you know, or in the church uh, as we're taking communion. So, I mean, communion is important. It's a holy, sacred event that Jesus told his disciples to do and remember, you know, every, you know, as often as they will, that we would remember Christ through those elements, right? So as we're looking at this, and he says that, that Jesus is powerful among you. In other words, don't just automatically assume that Jesus is just out there pie in the sky by and by, but he is part of the body. He's part of part. And go back and we could look at 1 Corinthians 12 again, that Christ is the head of the church. And if the body is unhealthy, Christ is not going to be pleased with an unhealthy body. And so that's why he's talking about these things. So, and then he comes in and he says, so if Christ's powerful among you, look at verse four, for he was crucified in weakness. Now, what weakness is he talking about? his human weakness, okay? Remember how uh, Martin has talked about that he was divine and he was human? Well, what Paul is referring to here is not his divinity. He's referring to his humanity. And in his humanity, he was weak, but he had to come in hum human form to be able to shed blood and die on the cross, to be a sacrifice. He couldn't do that in his divine form. So that's why he was saying, for he was crucified in weakness, in other words, in his humanity, but lives by the power of God. That's his divinity, okay? That's what Martin's been talking about when he's contributed before, about those two factors of who Jesus is and who he was when he was here on the earth. He was fully man and fully God, fully divine okay. and fully human. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. I missed the, the one uh, before, but I'm trying to understand when he says uh, back in the first sentence there that every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I understand it's going back to the Old Testament. Yeah, Deuteronomy. That, that, that was a law that was established. Right. But what, is he trying to say, like, okay, I'm bringing you 
charges against your sin. Uh, and I have witness because I don't know, it's like he puts a period as I want those who sinned before. Yeah. What he's talking about here is Titus was the last guy that was visiting. He's the one that brought him these letters. He would have brought the message, the report back to him. Well, what he's gotten back is that there are people in that body, in that church there at Corinth that were living in their sin. Well, remember when Jesus, well, I know you know how Jesus explained how church um, discipline was supposed to happen, that church discipline happens. You know, you yeah. remember that, right, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Again, you have to bring it up against the witness. Yes. That's right. And mm -hmm. what he's talking about here is that he's going to come because since these sins that we read at the end of chapter 12 are prevalent and people are living them out in that church body, when he comes, it, they need to be addressed because that church body isn't addressing them. They're not holding the people accountable. So he's saying, when I come on this, sec on this third visit, you guys need to have witnesses against these people that are living in sin, and we need to deal with them. And I mean, what he's kind of implying is that you should have already dealt with them. But since you haven't, on my third visit, when I come, have the witnesses ready because we're going to deal with these sins when I come. That's what he's talking about. Thank you. That's clear. Yeah. And, and that you, applies today. Again, oh, yeah. If you bring someone uh, charges, you have to have witness. You, know, you can't say, oh, I saw so and so sinning. That's right. It, it's not sufficient. Amen. Would, yeah, would Donna. Would it be what Jesus was talking about when he said, um, go and then take two or three witnesses and then go before the church? Is that kind of what yeah, he's talking that's about? That's the church discipline. Yeah. Jesus established that. Yeah. First, Remember, if a brother or sister sees another brother or sister in sin, that brother or sister is to go to that person. And in love, they are supposed to, you know, hey, brother, sister, you know, you're in this sin. I don't know if you realize that, but hey, let me help you. Let's, you know, let's pray about it. Let's repent. Let you repent about it. And if the person repents, it's all done. It's taken care of, right? That's the way Jesus put it. But if the person doesn't repent, says Paxan, you know, I'm fine. You're the one that's messed up. Get out of my face. Um, then what that other person does is they go to somebody else that knows and understands the same issue and knows that biblically it is not a healthy way of living their Christian life. And it needs to be addressed. Well, when you have various Christians in the body of Christ that have seen it, then they go together, two people, and they address the person you know, in other words, hey, but I've seen it too. You've got this issue and it needs to be dealt with here. Let me pray with you. Let's ask God to forgive that sin and help, let us help you bring you out of it. If the person repents, then it's a done deal. It doesn't have to be addressed anymore. It's good to go. But if the person says no, then like you said, Donna, then at that point, you take them before the church body. Then and the whole church body basically says, look, the only way you can stay in this church body is you can't live in that sin the way you are. You need to repent. If the person repents before the church body, it's a done deal. Okay. But if the person says, no, nah, you guys are just a bunch of fuddy duddies. You just aren't very, you know, progressive. And, you know, man, I'm fine the way I am. Then in that point, at that point, Jesus said, then you ask them to leave. They're out of there and you treat them like an unbeliever. In other words, They've got issues they need to deal with. They need to get their hearts right with the Lord again. Yeah, so that's the church discipline that Paul is talking about here, too. And, uh, Ted? Yeah, Mark. I would say we could also apply that in a different situation. Let's say, especially before men, you should never enter a house without a witness, especially if it is a, a minor, if a, a female minor. Or, or, or a woman that you don't know. You should never go in there without a witness because you could apply the same situation. That's why Mike Pence says he does not get into a car with a female because <laughs> once you have an accusation, guess what? Especially for a man, yeah. you're always going to be guilty yeah. until proving innocent. Yeah, he, so there yeah are things exactly. that you could apply the same, the same concept in a, in a different situation to have yeah. a witness. If you're going to go to someone's house, have a witness because it's not just going to accuse you. You're by yourself. Guess what? It's your war against the other person. That's right. Amen. And if you go to court, you're not guilty. Yeah, they want they want proof. Exactly. Mm -hmm. 
That's the reason why when you're doing EE, they want you to go out in threes with yeah, right. two guys and one woman or two women and one guy because too much could happen. Yep. You know, with just, a, just a, like say a one, like a man and a woman, both of them are married to other people and they start doing this. It's just too easy for yep. either something to happen or to just to be accused. Yep. You know? And so accountability is important before the Lord, isn't it? Yeah, well, we're supposed to abstain from all appearances of evil. Yeah, and yeah. so if they could possibly raise an eyebrow, then, you know, you need to abstain from it. That's all. Yep. I mean, exactly. And also, you can also apply the other. The Bible says what? Be wise as a serpent. Be gentle as a dove, right? So Amen. that's a, that's a yep. proverb. God. You can always, always apply to our lives. Amen. Amen. So, I mean, these are important factors. I mean, what Paul's bringing out here, as you can see, is not something that was just esoteric and only dealt with that time and that culture. It applies to us today. And we need to have the same kind of, you know, focus in our churches today to be following the Lord in the way the Lord wants us to be following him and not just automatically accepting sin in our churches, like if, oh, it's no problem, that's fine. If you wanna live that way, it's okay. Hey, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. You know, that's, that's not what brings honor and glory to God. And I think that they were kind of, here in the church at Corinth, they were, they were looking at sin kind of like, uh, it's, you're, you're treating it like as if it's totally bad. It's no big deal. Yeah, I don't have to do it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the alcoholic person, you know, in a stage of denial. Well, that's kind of like what these people were. They were in that stage of denial, like, no, it's no big deal. Don't worry about it. You know, you're sweating the small stuff. When in fact, sin is, is an abomination before God. If, the, if you're doing it just out of spite or you're doing it without thinking about what am I doing to the Lord? Am I praising the Lord here or am I grieving the spirit in the process? And that was the whole thing that was really bothering Paul about many of those that were in the church that they were just flippant about their Christianity and they were living in sin just way too easily. And that's why he was coming to visit. And that's why he was coming to hold them accountable for their sin. And he wanted those witnesses to be available. So that's why he talks about Jesus and that he died in weakness, but he lives in the power of God. That was his divinity. For look what he says, then he contrasts it, for we also are weak in him. In other words, in our flesh, we're weak in him, right? The spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak, right? For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him in the power of God. So in other words, by being obedient to God, though if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You know, obedience is central to showing that we love God. If we love him, we'll obey him. Well. That's what he's saying here is that, look, hey, in the flesh, I may be weak, but I'll tell you, I come in the power of God to address these issues of weakness that you have been displaying that you don't want to deal with. Well, we're going to come and help you deal with those. You know, it won't be pleasant, but we're coming to help you deal with those issues. So that's what he's talking about here in terms of how he's wrapping up his letter to them is that, hey, come on, these things can't continue in your church. They have to be addressed at the source. And if the people aren't willing to repent, then you've got to get them out of there before they end up, you know, uh, polluting the whole flock. In other words, hey, the more those people stay in and live in their sin, the other people are, you know, especially any of the weaker Christians are going to think, well, then it's okay. Look at, hey, so-and-so's doing it. So you see the issue, see why sin has to be addressed and people have to be held accountable in our church bodies, that we can't just flippantly practice and live in sin. It's not that we won't ever sin, but it should never be a part of our practice because what ends up happening is others see you doing it. And if they aren't strong Christians, they may think, well, oh, it's okay. Look, Ted does it. So it's got to be okay. Well, shame on me if that's how I'm living and others end up sinning because of me. See, that's not what God wants. Okay, so any questions about that and how that still is in our churches today? And I think sometimes we fall short of holding people accountable, don't we? Uh -huh. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, 
I also in that passage that you know, it says about being weak, you know, you know, there's a, a belief out there for some Christian uh, of the same way as I prosperity gospel. Oh, that yeah. you're supposed to be prosperous in everything you do. <laughs> in other words, if you are sick, if you are suffering, well, you're not, you're not prospering. Right. You, you must not be in God's will because God wants you to be blessed at all time. All we, the time. Yeah. No suffering and basically no problem. So there is a belief some Christians out there that think, well, if you're suffering, you know what? You might not be in the will of God. Yeah. Tell me to Joseph, who got sold into slavery yep. and went to prison. <laughs> Look at all he had to go through. Ah, you, I find, you, know, you know what? They don't read those passages. No, of about. course not. Because no, they, they only read, read the ones that, that say. If you haven't seen the advertising that, that Joe Austin has right now, oh, that is, uh, it's, it's a cube that, that, you, that you could buy and you will press. And he has some prayers there, you know, wherever they announce. You, you, they, it's for sale on, on the television right now. Oh, man. Yeah, it's like, it's like the takeoff of the, of the Alexa thing, but it's his own little, his own little thing. I saw that. Oh, uh, doohickey. And this cube. whole thing with this cube thing is it goes back to um, uh, Babylon. You know, and a lot of yeah. the churches are these cube things in there, and it's getting kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah, the point, the point is, listen, you, you're not supposed to be suffering uh, because since Christ uh, paid, paid the price on the cross, you know, he took all your suffering. So, hey, you, you are free of suffering. You're free of pain. So if you are in pain, you, you must not be in the way of God. You probably don't have enough faith. Sad, isn't it? Yeah. I well, mean, all the suffering that Paul did, but it does make me, you know, God's ways are not my ways because that sure doesn't make sense. Paul did all that suffering and then he was martyred martyred you know he's walking damascus and god hits him upside the head and he does a 180 and then god lets him be martyred <laughs> yeah but look how long before that happened look at what he all also, he had to endure yeah but he also told him um i think it what was the guy's name um ananias that, ananias he says tell him you know, how that, much that he will have to suffer for my name's sake. Yeah, so yep. he told him up front. He said, you're going to suffer. <laughs> yep. so, um, you know, how many churches, would have, how many people would come forward and say, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus. Because if you get to do this, you're going to be suffering. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you, it, it, it's clear, too, that Jesus said, hey, you're... Never does Jesus say that everything is going to be this utopia panacea once you come into salvation. As a matter of fact, he made it clear that you will have to suffer for my name's sake. Not just Paul, but anyone yeah, that comes to Christ. Yeah. But I, I mean, it, 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 there's a perfect example in the passage, I mean, in the, in the Bible, is John the Baptist, which, you know, until today, it's hard to comprehend that because how can Christ allow for John the Baptist to be beheaded? He lost his head. He was preaching the gospel. He wasn't doing anything wrong. Just because an evil king decided that, you know, he, he, he because obviously he he uh he preached against his sin. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at the capital. So there's a lot of things that a lot of passages in the Bible that if you are uh, were to analyze it for the human perspective, of course it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. But the issue comes down to this: what do you love more? Do you love Lord Jesus Christ more or do you love this body that is only going to be here for a while or do you love this body more, you know? And that's the issue. Are you willing to surrender your life for the Lord Jesus Christ? That's the real question when we come into relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you willing to surrender your life for him? And if you're not, then maybe you better not be following Christ. And we have to remember that the promises in the Bible are not for this earth. It's not for us That's to right. stay here for, for eternal life. That's we, right. we go into a separate place, a, 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 a heaven. Amen. Not here. The promise is not for here. We're all going to die. Yep. We all get older every day. Yep. Some people think they're not, but we <laughs> are. <laughs> yeah, they think that, you know, as, as they say in the old days, you know, back in the Old Testament, king, live forever, you know, as, as they're greeting. Yeah, live forever. What? You ain't living forever. Yeah, not here today. Yeah, uh, <laughs> they're not here today at all. Okay, <laughs> so so let's go to verse five. But look what he says now. I mean, I think this puts it into perspective. There are people in the church 
that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Look what he says. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Uh, uh, uh. So there are people, that tells me, there are people in the church today that think that they're Christians or they think they're good enough. But the question is, are they really, do they really have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are they living for Christ or are they living for self? And that's where you have to tell yourself. You have to examine yourself. Or, and he says, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? In other words, if you've got a relationship, what are you doing to Jesus if you're living in that sin? Because Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit's in you. God is in you. So what are you doing? Are you basically flippantly just saying, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do after you've come to Jesus Christ? That's why he's saying, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Maybe you aren't, folks. Maybe you're just living your natural life because you've never really ever had a conversion into Christianity. You've never really given your life over to Christ in the first place. So I think that that's a sobering comment that Paul makes there. And I think people need to really check that, you know, especially if they're not living in the way that Christ has called us to live, the way the Bible's called us to live. Maybe we need to ask the question, have I really turned my life over to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or am I just trying to do it myself? Or do I have my own kind of agenda? And yeah, and that's that can be problematic, can it? Because that's not where we want to be. We don't want to be in a place where all of a sudden we start saying, you know, think about it. If we stand before the Lord, you don't want to hear the words, I never knew you, get thee from me, right? We want to hear the words, you know, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into your rest. I mean, that's what we want to hear. So we need to be sure that we've got our, our focus right on the Lord. Go ahead, Donna. Well, it, this kind of bookends with the Psalm 139, the last verse says, Search me, O God, and show me if there's any wicked way in me, and yep. lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. So... You know, I pray that prayer all the time or well, every day yep. because I want to examine myself, but, but I want God to examine my Amen. heart <laughs> because my heart um, is deceitfully wicked. So. Good point. Uh, good point. Because look at what he says. Test yourselves unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Oh, boy. Hey, we don't want to be there. Go ahead, Mark. You know, another thing I will say, we, the church today in general, I think that's one thing that we are missing, and it's passion. Amen. I, I Amen. think there's no passion for God. That's why, you know, people say, oh, it's raining today. Oh, I'm not going to church. Hey, this is going on. I'm not, I'm not going to church. So wh where is our passion? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was reading something about David Platt. You know, he said, yeah. got your mission. You know, he, he, he made a comment in, in, in Twitter today. And he said that, you know, what's going on? A lot of people are disappointed, but we got to keep focusing on Christ. Amen. Because if you, if you keep your focus on this earthly things that's going on, you're going to get disappointed. Very you know, well our said. passion should be for Christ, regardless of what. Amen. Amen. And uh, I agree with you. I think it really comes down to what is most important in your lives. Whatever is most important, you will give time, you will dedicate, you know, your life to that. And I'll tell you, it needs to be Christ in our lives. And that's why we need to test ourselves. Are we really in him? Is he the most important thing to us in every daily breath that we take? And Christ needs to be there. He needs to be that focus point. And the Holy Spirit gives us that strength. So I think it's, it's a sober warning that Paul's giving them here. You know, hey guys, are you sure you've really come into a relationship with Jesus Christ? Or did you just say the magic prayer, right? Yeah, the prayer doesn't save. It's the turning over of your life to the Lord Jesus Christ that saves. Yeah, the prayer can help you get focused on that, but it's, it's not that that saves you. When Donna and, and others and I have been out, you know, uh, witnessing, we make that clear. It's not the prayer. You know, we can pray with you. But it's not the prayer that saves. It's, have you really, are you really serious about turning your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, because it's, it's that making him Lord of your life 
And then you be committed to following him. That really determines whether you are in the faith or not, right? And it's all by grace. He does all the heavy lifting. The matter is, are you willing to come into relationship with him? That's the issue. That's the issue. And apparently there were many in the church at Corinth that were having issues and weren't going to that extreme because they were content with their life the way it was. But they enjoyed being in the church too and having these wonderful ministers come in that met their desires of, you know, these great speakers and these, these people that just totally impressed them and made them feel good, of which Paul said, I, don't, I can't live up to those kind of guys I, because they didn't. See, the thing in Corinth is I don't think they wanted to really hear the true message of Jesus Christ. They wanted something like, you know, what, what Martin was talking about with, uh, what was his name, Joel Osteen. Yeah. Joel Osteen, man, he knows how to make people feel good and hear what they want to hear. He knows how to tickle ears. That's not what brings you into salvation with Jesus Christ. But people love that kind of, see, that's what the church at Corinth would have loved to have brought into their church was Joel's. Oh, bring us Joel. We want to hear him today. See, and Paul says, no, I'm not a Joel Olstein. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I come because I love you and I want to give you the good news. That's what he's talking about here. And that's where these people were having issues and they weren't living up to it. And I think Paul's making it really clear here. Check your salvation. Go ahead, Donna. You know, you're, you're talking about Joel Osteen, but he's among the ones like Kenneth Copeland is like leading it where he wants us to all go back to the Catholic Church. Have you heard of that? No. Uh -uh. That old, um, um, <clears throat> there was a guy named Tony Palmer that came over and met with Kenneth Copeland. And he said, oh, we're all Catholics now. We're all going to go back to the Catholic Church and we're going to apologize for the um, pro for being Protestants and leaving the, the, that church after all. And, you know, you're seeing all of this stuff that's leading literally to Bible prophecy of the one world religion that's, you know, but I mean, we're going to forget about all the people that were murdered when they tried to leave the Catholic church and all of that stuff that went on. And we're going to just go right back and um, kiss and make up. I don't think so, but that's what, that's what they're trying to do. Ecumenical, ecumenic. Ecumenism, ecumenism, yeah. Ecumenism, yeah. yeah. Ecumenism, ecumenism and the ecumenical work, yeah. That that happened a lot uh, back when they when they did the uh, what's the <clears throat> word for that? Ah, um, uh, just slipped my mind because there was a movement back that was ecumenical, uh, the ecumenical movement, but there was a word for it and that just slipped my mind. But anyway, yeah, that's why we've got to keep our eyes on the Lord and we've got to keep our eyes on God's word and not look to things of this world. We can't, we can't be motivated in that. Hey, God's word is truth and he's the one that gives us direction. And man, we can't lose focus on that, folks. We can't lose focus on that. And so that's what Paul's trying to tell them. So he says in verse six, I hope you will find out that we have not failed to test. In other words, hey, we're in Christ and we want to build you up in Christ too, okay? But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Notice that he's, he's always praying for those he cares about. We pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right though we may seem to have failed. In other words, they've been, you know, judging Paul. We've talked about this in First and Second Corinthians, where they've been judging Paul like as if, you know, he's failed them. But the reality is, is that they've just wanted to live their own way. And they've been kind of pushing Paul aside and, and letting others come in and teach them false doctrine. I mean, there was that one place uh, just two chapters ago where we were, where it sounded like he was exhorting them just like he did the Galatians, that he, they were letting people in that were giving them other doctrine that was not solid doctrine, it was leading them astray. It was basically going into legalism, was going into self-serving kind of a religion. And he's saying, that's not where you wanna be folks. That's not Christ Jesus. So don't listen to that. That's not the good news I brought to you. 
You know, I brought you the good news. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. Follow Christ. That's what matters. So that's what he's talking about here as he's, as he's basically justifying himself that, hey, you know, we didn't come to bring you something false. We brought you truth in Christ Jesus, and that's what matters. It's not about Paul. It never was about Paul. It's about Christ Jesus and him crucified and what he did for you. So don't be looking to Paul. Don't be holding Paul as he's not good enough or good enough, but look to the message. What is the message? Because I come bringing the message because that's what Jesus sent me to bring. And so that's the point he's trying to make to them. For he says, for we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. In other words, I'm not going to bring something false to you. I, I can't even do that. But I come because Christ sent me to bring the message of good news to you. And that's what I bring. And I hold you all accountable for following it for those of you who truly have professed it and are living in it. But we've got to fix this so that your body will be healthy. Think about uh, Revelation 1 through 3, right? Well, 1 through 2. Remember it talks about the, the churches, the seven churches. Remember how Jesus ended up speaking of the different churches? Remember yes. Ephesus? Remember how he told them, but you've lost your first love? You've gone away from your first love? I mean, so what you see is that in 90 AD, if you go back 30 years to when, you know, maybe 30 to 40 years when Paul brought the church at Ephesus up, look, they had already drifted away. In just 30 to 40 years, they had already drifted away. You know, and, and you look at the different churches, and many of those, Paul had you know, been the one to establish those churches. And you look at the things that, you know, Jesus was talking about to those churches. And I'll tell you, it makes it clear that some of them were falling away or falling into other areas that were not pleasing to God either. So it's not just the Corinthians that were having problems, but the reality is Satan's out there. And he tries to disrupt and divide every body of Christ in any way possible. And guess what? The world is a strong one that Satan uses to divide the body of Christ. He, he uses the world because the world has a strong attraction to the flesh. And if we don't take this flesh under control every day, die to self every day, guess what? We'll fall into the ways of the world. It's just because that's the, that's the natural man. That's, not, that's what the natural man wants to do. But in the new man that we are, or the new person that we've become, that's not our lifestyle. We need to be in that transformed lifestyle that Romans 12, 2 talks about in the new man. So that's why he says in verse 9, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. In other words, hey, it's not about us, but it's about how you are growing in the Lord. That's more important than anything, is that you know Jesus and you're growing in him and you're modeling him, you're reflecting him, that's what he's calling about. You are strong. You're not living in sin. You're living in victory over the ruler of this world. You're living in victory through the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit in you. That's what he's talking about. That's why he's saying that's when he's glad is when he sees them overcoming and victors over the evil one. That's what makes in, that's when they are strong is when they put Satan out of the picture and they're following Christ totally. Your restoration is what we pray for. So in other words, all these issues that he's been talking about in the letter, that's what he wants to see them come out of. He wants them to test themselves. He wants them to hold each other accountable. He wants them to restore the faith in Christ that should be there and not be living in sin and not letting Satan cause divisions in that body. And that's what Paul's talking about. And that's why he's saying that's what we pray for is your restoration. For this reason, I write these things while I'm away from you. In other words, hey, it's easier to write and say things objectively and stronger when you're not in person, right? But he says that when I come, I may not have to be as severe in my use of that authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. In other words, what he's saying, I'm giving you an opportunity that when I come this third time, you will have taken to heart everything I've written here. You will have done what needs to be done. That way, when I come, guess what? I don't have to rehash this stuff and be, you know, basically more uh, uh, stronger in terms of what action needs to be done. 
But instead, we can rejoice in the Lord because you've already addressed these issues and you're walking in the, in the propriety of Jesus Christ and in his righteousness. And if you do that, then, hey, our visit's going to be a great, you know, uh, fellowship together as we worship the Lord together and bring him honor and glory. Instead of making it, you know, uh, a judgmental visit where we have to address these things in terms of church discipline to be able to try to get this church back on track and getting the sin out of the church, and instead living in the way Christ wants to live, and be an effective body of Christ with Christ at the head. And that's what he's talking about. That's why he's addressing this letter the way he is. Okay, then he's going to go into final greeting. So any questions about what he's talking about here, what we've been talking about, or the issues that Corinth needed to resolve, and the problems that they had internally within the church there at Corinth? Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Mark on, on verse 5 again. Okay. Uh, that is a key verse there. Yep. Where it says, you know, for us to examine ourselves, because we got to apply to our life today, okay? Amen. Even though it's to the Corinthian brother. Now, yes. how do we apply that today? You know, as a Christian, uh, I believe we, we do have to examine ourselves, you know, to Amen. see if, if we are walking in faith. Amen. Is my faith increasing for, for God or is it decreasing? You know, the same way we take a car to the mechanic. I just got myself a physical this week. They gave me a shot. So the same way I think as uh, spiritually, we should ask ourselves, okay, I've been a Christian for X amount of year. How is my fire for God? How is my passion for God? Is it increasing or is it diminishing? Do I have an interest to know, to know God more? Or I'm just so passive that I don't care anymore. So, the, you know, Paul said we have to examine ourselves. Amen. And like, like the psalmist says, you know, for the Holy Spirit to seek me and to see if there is any hidden sin in me. Because yeah. sometimes, you know, I, I could fool anyone, right? We could fool each other. Oh, yeah. But we cannot fool God. Can't fool him. We cannot fool ourselves. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I'm just yeah. going through the motion just to be in church so they could see me on Sunday yeah. and, and pretend that, okay, I'm growing. Or, or, or basically, the taste for God has diminished. Oh, good point, Martin. I'll tell you. That's, that's what it's all about, because it's about pleasing God. He's our Savior. If he's our Lord, then we should be living for him daily in a way that pleases him, and, and not just individually, but as a unity in the body of Christ. We should be living for God together, collectively, because it's collectively that we make up the body, not individually, but collectively, in unity. That's where we make up the body of Christ. And that's where we need to be. We need to be in his strength and his power, reflecting him as the body of Christ. And as a matter of fact, Jesus was even clear that when we come together that way in his love, that that's the way the world would be able to know that we really are, you know, uh, the body of Christ. We are, we are children of God is by the way that we demonstrate our love together in unity and being there for each other. And the Holy Spirit does that. You know, he can do that through us if we allow him. Is that that's how he gifts us so that we can build up the body through our giftedness together. And it's about building up and not tearing down, right? So that's what the real key issue is. Are we walking in the Lord? Do we have a passion for him? Is he Lord of our life? Is he Lord of our churches too? You know, because that it's got to be there too. I mean, it's kind of like what Jean talked about, you know, where she went to, you know, a church. If I was going to preach a message, I, and all of a sudden I had to say something that seemed, or I mean, I read something in the Bible that to me all of a sudden seemed to put Jesus down, I would have to go do some serious studying because just in my heart, I know that in the Word of God, Jesus is Lord. And I could never in any way from a pulpit or even from teaching be able to say, well, Jesus really was, you know some some other kind of guy or fit into this wrong mold as we categorize people in our culture today. No, I could never say that. You know, I mean, because I love him and I know that he loves me way more than I can ever return that love to him. He would never do something that was inappropriate, sinful, uncaring, uh, contrary to God's word, so, I mean, I, if something like that crossed my mind, I would have to go say, no, the, the God could never be that way. So I would have to go find why I was coming to that conclusion, albeit a wrong one. You see what I'm saying? I would never put it out in front of other people 
as Jesus not being there. So, I mean, we just need to be careful because it's way easy to make a mistake today. And if you're in behind the pulpit, you can't take it back. You can say, well, that's not really what I meant. You know, you're, once you say it from behind the pulpit, you're accountable. And we need to be careful. Yeah, and Ted, I just want to add there. Yeah. You know, some people say, you know, church is boring. <laughs> oh, you know, it's, this is boring. You know, it's it's right. boring in church. You know why this pro said? The reason why people find church boring is because the pastor does not reveal God's character. Amen. But God is never boring. Amen. Amen. I agree with you, Martin. That's a beautiful picture. Did you have something, Victor? Oh. Okay, I thought I saw you about ready to talk there last time. Okay, so now we go into his final greetings. Now, Paul always, you know, he's always wants them to understand that he cares about them big time, okay? Just like when he opens up a letter, he closes a letter with a good greeting, a solid greeting, because he's, he's not trying to alienate anybody. Because the reality is, hey, we're all sinners, right? But we also are zealous for people to walk in Christ's righteousness too. And that was Paul. So he says in verse 11, finally, brothers, rejoice. Hey, you know, after all that I've told you, trying to address all these shortcomings you have, but hey, in Christ, rejoice. Aim for restoration. So in other words, the issue is there's problems. So aim for restoration. And one of the ways you do that, look at this, comfort one another. In other words, don't tear each other down. Because isn't that the human nature thing? Hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear you up because you got that wrong, man. I'm, I don't want it that way. No, he says, comfort one another. And look what he says. Agree with one another. Okay, in other words, don't, don't become arguments that produce nothing. Remember, Paul had said that before to one of the churches where he said, don't get involved in arguments that, that produce nothing. You know, in other words, people get tied in arguments. I think he told that to Timothy. You know, that those things that profit, oh, that was the word profit. Don't get involved in arguments that profit nothing. Well, that's what he's talking about. Agree with one another. Don't get into these arguments that profit nothing, okay? Look what he said. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So in other words, remember, remember in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, Man. And, and they inherit the kingdom of God, right? I mean, Peace is central to God's character. It's, part of, it's a part of his love, is, is reflected in peace, okay? And then look what he says. Now, greet one another with a holy kiss. So I think we're falling short on that. I don't think we kiss each other much. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> you can't know, dude. With our masks on. Yeah. <laughs> with the coronavirus now. <laughs> That was a cultural thing. That was a cultural thing. Just like we were talking about woman. Well, greet one another with a holy kiss. Back in that culture, and even in men, much of that culture today, in the Arabic culture and in Jewish culture, they still kiss, kiss each other on both cheeks, okay? But in this case, they were doing it as a brother or sister in Christ. They would do it, and that was a holy kiss. It's, we are family. You know, you were kissing family, basically. It's, it's not where you're locking lips and having this romantic kiss. It's not that. It's, it's basically just a greeting to each other. I guess you could kind of say like a peck on the cheek would be, you know, what we would see it as in a sense. It, what you would do to your family member, like a, a brother and sister, or what you would do with your mother or your father, you know, when you hug them, you give them a kiss. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. in other words, that's what that would have been. But it's, it's a holy kiss. And look at Paul always speaks for all of those that are in Christ Jesus. All the saints greet you. Now, the saints was a label placed to all the believers, okay? A believer, once you came into Christ Jesus, Holy Spirit, and dwelt you, you're labeled as a saint. You, all of us are saints in Christ who have given our lives over to Jesus Christ. So that's what he's saying. He's saying, hey, all the believers in Christ greet you. And he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Look at what he does. He, he brings Jesus, the Son, love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So he brings all three, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, their grace, the grace of God be with you. And it's that grace 
that is sufficient, right? It's that grace that brings us his wonder and his glory to people that don't deserve it, but yet he gives it to us freely. And that's what Jesus came to carry out. It was his sacrifice that brought that grace to us. And that's why in Ephesians 2.8, it says, for by grace, you have been saved through faith. In other words, it's God's giving you something freely that you don't deserve, and we accept it by faith, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not something we do. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. So when you look at it that way, you understand what that grace is all about. And once we come into his presence, we are adopted into his family, as Romans 8 talks about. We then are to live out that life in a way that reflects Christ, that reflects that love, that shows the unity and the power of the body as it demonstrates its love for one another. And that wraps up Corinthians, first and second Corinthians. So any questions, comments, additions, subtractions, disagreements? You know, Ted, I would say, going back to the verse 12 there, it says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Uh-huh. Okay, it's true. That's not our culture today, but we have gone <laughs> to the other extreme now. Yeah. That people who see you, they don't even <laughs> probably say good morning to you. It's like they look at a statue. I mean, yeah. it's like, uh, <laughs> which is the preacher I was listening to. You know, it said, I have joy in my heart. But, yeah. Then, yeah. but then the outside looks like you're being baptized with lemon juice. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because yeah. <laughs> if, if you say you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit, you shouldn't have, I mean, we all go through problems in life, but at the end, you, you're supposed to have a grateful heart. Amen. You know what I mean? So Amen. it should reflect that we are thankful for the new day that God's given exactly. me. Exactly. You know, when I go to church, and when I see my brothers and sister, I might not know them, but at least acknowledge them, give them a smile, and say yeah. good morning. Because this is not this is not this is not a corporation. This is a church. Amen. Some people are mistaking corporation with church. This is not corporate here. It's nope. a church. Amen. Amen. Did you have something, Donna? I did. Um, oh, go ahead, Gene. The election. It's got me thinking. With Obama, from what I understand, our taxes paid for Planned Parenthood, which paid for abortions. Abortions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I feel like. You know, I pay taxes. I have innocent blood on my hands, but I don't think God expects us to leave the country. No. But from uh, let, can I explain that real quick before you f keep going? Sure. See, the Bible talks about that we as individuals are held, held accountable for what we do, okay? But nations are also held accountable for what they do. We have to live within the government. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's and render unto God that which is God's, right? So we still have to pay our taxes. But if the nation uses those taxes in a way that displeases God, God will judge them. Remember, even the Jews, they, at one point, they were offering some of their children to Molech. In other words, that they were sacrificing their children to idols, and God took that as an abomination against the nation, not against the individual specifically, but against the nation as a whole. And they, God had them, you know, basically uh, gave them a spanking because of that. Well, that's the same with us. In it's You pay your taxes because that's what God calls us to do. You're not responsible for how the country uses the taxes, because if that was the case, we wouldn't buy anything from anybody because everybody at some level uses money at any organization uses money at some level that probably isn't a value that we would support as Christians, but yet we still have to do it. So to boycott all these places, you'd end up without any, any support whatsoever. Each one is responsible for their organization. The country is responsible for their country. And now, if you do it yourself specifically, then you're responsible for it individually, specifically. If you're not doing it under the label of the nation or under the label of like a company where you have to do certain things. And in some cases, you may just have to leave a company. If you work for a company that's doing something that you just can't agree with, you may have to submit your resignation and ask God to open up an opportunity and a job where, it, you know, they meet all your values, so to speak. So keep going, Gene. No, I think I was done. You okay. Answered, but an example of that, I, 
I used to have a friend that was a physician's assistant uh -huh. and he refused to give the morning after pill, uh -huh. which was, um, but they let him keep the job. But I understand what you're saying. It just yep. nags at me to know that yeah. I'm contributing to abortion. Yeah. And and I, it, I think Trump reversed it, but now it looks like we're back to the democratic. Yeah leadership uh, it, it's sad it's sad and i mean but the reality is we live in a fallen world gene and yeah. unfortunately we're not going to find any area where we can live where everything is just going to fit god's plan and purpose That's it's true. just not going to happen in this fallen world yeah martin did you have something yeah i will say uh ted that uh, i agree with what you said but I also will add that a lot of Christians violate their conscience when they vote. True. Uh, basically, they, they are born against their principle. I don't know. I guess their promise that the, that the politician is, is, is making is, heavy, is heavier than what they believe. Good because point. According yeah. to what they, they, the way they vote, it's totally it's against what the politician stands for. So True. how can you vote uh, with, or go with someone that, that is basically everything that stands for is against your principle. But hey, to each his own. Right. No, huh? Hey, I wish it was a perfect world, but it's not. You know, and where humans are involved, guess what? Human nature gets in the way. Yes, indeed. And uh, I would say a lot of people do not uh, apply their Bible to their daily living. Amen. Uh, hey, I'm with you, brother. I'm with you. And hey, and I've, I've fallen short at times, I know. But man, I'll tell you, I'm like, Lord, don't let me do that again. Or don't let me be that way because that doesn't reflect you. And I ask for forgiveness right away and change it, you know. So, I mean, we're all capable of, of stumbling. But man, just look to the Lord and say, man, Lord, you know, as, as you guys were talking about in Psalm 139, like Donna and Martin said, you know, like, you know, search my heart, see if there is any evil or wicked way in me. And, but, you know, forgive me basically, but lead me in the path to life everlasting. In other words, let me walk with you. Let me walk by the spirit so that I won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. That's what I want, Lord, you know, and then be focused on it. Make, make it a priority in your life every single day, because that's the only way it'll happen. And I tell you, if you don't, if you don't do it every day, I guarantee you that you'll be doing what the body wants to do, the flesh wants to do. It's, it's something that it's got to be a discipline. It's got to be an action that we take. It doesn't happen just automatically. It's something that we have to want to do. It's something we have to desire more than anything else. And that's to follow Christ. Yeah, like you said, uh, we don't have no control of the nation. Right. That's boring. But... <laughs> God would, God's as you see in the, in the Old Testament, and God would judge the nation. Oh, yeah. And unfortunately, we all pay the consequences. Yep. Yep. So, Is anybody what, else? Uh, oh, yeah, go ahead, Vicar. Go ahead. Isn't that what Lynn did? She was pressured on her job and to do yep. things that she didn't want to, and she left. But I'll tell you that those are situations. And uh, yeah, Lynn. Uh, I mean, Lynn felt convicted that that just wasn't the place for her at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes that that is tough because you need the income, but yeah. yet at the same time, there's a problem. You have a moral problem with the issue. And yeah. And in some cases, God may lay on your heart that this isn't the place for you, but I'll take care of you. I'll get you something else in a better way. Yeah. More power to her. Amen. 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 Yeah, Donna. They had to go in the hot, the fiery furnace, you know, because they wouldn't bow, wouldn't down, bow down to the golden idol. And yet, um, also, while that that happened after the whole nation of it, of uh, Judah got taken into captivity into Babylon because of their sin. That's right. The righteous and the unrighteous got taken in there. That's it. But we saw that the the righteous still one favor in, with the king, even yeah. though they were, um, you know, they, they had, they, they tried to keep, they were prisoners or whatever. They still um, stuck to their guns and um, did what they knew was right. And God honored that. 
Amen. Absolutely. And I believe that there's going to be a time not too long from now that we're going to have the same, we're all going to have those kind of decisions that we're going to have to choose. That's it. Choose today who we're going to serve. If it seems good for you to serve the the enemy, then serve him. But if it seems good to see the serve the Lord, but for me and my house, you know, we'll I'm going to serve the Lord. Yeah, I like Joshua. Joshua's I statement. Yeah. I think I'm strong enough to do that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and you're right. It's coming to a point where we're going it, to, it's going to really separate the chaff and the, and the wheat. We're yep. going to find out because then are you going to, are you going to deny Christ or are you going to stand up for Christ? He's going to yeah. electrify the fence. <laughs> you, you get in or get out because the nope. fence isn't gonna, you're not gonna be able to sit on the fence and no nope. and be a, a lukewarm uh christian anymore you're gonna have to nope. choose you're gonna have to take a stand that's right so Amen. Amen. and i will say this might be the beginning of a, of a new era it could as be. you know uh this nation is not mentioned in, in the in the end time so that's true uh, this might this might be a new beginning that could be, could be, but we keep our eyes on the Lord no matter what, because hey, that's that's who matters. Amen. Well, it's, it's, a, it's like a movie. Yeah, whatever happens, only <laughs> happens. We don't have no yeah. control. Yeah. Believe me, it's walking towards the. I mean, like people say, "Oh, what's going on?" Well, read your Bible. It's going to happen. Amen. It's going to happen. It's written. It's going to happen. Amen. Yep. You know, I was doing this lady's hair the other day, and she says, I have never read the Bible, and I don't want to read the Bible, because I don't want to know what's going to happen. <laughs> I just want to live in my ignorance. <laughs> it was really sad. It was really sad, because oh, I was man. trying to share a little bit with her, and um, yeah. I've only done her hair a few times so far, and I try to develop a rapport, and I let it be conversational, and I have had people pray to receive Christ while sitting in my chair, but, Amen. but I, I always really pray that God, um, it's conversational and, and it's really the Holy spirit and not me trying Amen. to push it, you know, so. Amen. I'm with you. I know what you mean. Some people say, and I love God, but I will not go to church. <laughs> well, yeah. it's like, God, I love you, but your people, I can't stand. Right. <laughs> 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 oh, oh, basically, they would say, you know, when I, I guess uh, they have a bunch of hypocrites. So when I find a perfect church, then I will go. Yep. No such thing. No such thing. Amen, brother. I was going to say sometimes when things happen, you just have to walk away. Like yesterday, um, and this is just a sample. I, this little boy, it, it was in the playground and have a knife, like a toy knife, but it was Sharpie. And he was trying to just like pinching the other children. And I say, Ivan, I just told the mom and she's not listening. I told her nicely. So I say to the little boy, hey, don't play with the little kids doing that. I say, Ivan, if the mother don't say something, we're leaving because I'm going to lose it. And I don't know who I'm going to smack. I'm going to lose all the spirit. I don't know if I'm going to smack the mother or the child. <laughs> I, hey, I know. I know. We just what we just left because I was gonna lose it. I was, I, I, I was the best. <laughs> just walk out. Yep. And I think I want to spank the parents. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> the parent was just in the cell phone and didn't care that the child was pinching <laughs> the other kids with that toy knife, and it was sharp. It was dangerous. Not good. I hear you. Okay. So Ted, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, what's next? Which, where, which one are we going to do next? No, that, that was the question I was going to ask. What do you <laughs> want to do next? Where, where are we going? Do you want to do a gospel? Do you want to do another, uh, you know, letter, Paul, one another of Paul's letters? I vote um, for a gospel. Okay. Yeah, gospel. I, want to do, I vote for the gospel of John. <laughs> uh, we do, did, have, if we do Luke, we'll be hitting it right about Christmas time, won't we? The Christmas story is in Luke, right? So if we hit not, Luke, we all have to sing. Let me yeah. see. <laughs> no, I just think the Christmas story is in Luke, and we'll probably be hitting it. Although it might be a little early, but that would be a good kind of timely thing. But 
John is going to. I don't care. Oh, we could do John. Um, we've we never done did. John. There you go. We already did that a few years ago. What's that, mm -hmm. Margaret? I said we already did the Gospel of John back in in early 2016. Did we? I don't have any notes. I guess maybe I, I didn't I use it. <laughs> Margaret's got it all in that little computer there. Oh, first. she does. Because I mean, <laughs> yeah, I started I started taking notes in 2017, I see. So that's that's probably it. I probably did that. Okay. Well, I still probably got the old notes. Well, and that's possible too. Um would you rather do Luke? You did him too. I was just the only reason I was suggesting Luke is that it, it's got the Christmas story in it, and we it would be um, we'd probably be hitting it right about in a timely manner. That's all. That was the only reason I was thinking it. Yeah, I don't care. Doctor Luke. Doctor Luke. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. Well. We could we could do Luke or Acts, but I understand what Donna's saying about you know Christmas. But I mean, it doesn't matter to me because I know Jesus wasn't born in December twenty fifth anyway, so it doesn't matter to me. But that's only well, it. what we could probably do is Luke Acts. You know, go down that track as uh, Doctor Luke's writings. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we could do that. that would um, work. Because it, it, that provides a big story. It provides the whole story from Jesus all the way through, you know, uh, the spread of the gospel. Right. Um, so, yeah, that, that might be a good thing. The other question is, when was the last time we, we studied a, a book from the Old Testament? Well, that's, yeah, that's the other thing I was going to bring up. I, we have not done an Old Testament uh, yeah. writing. Yeah. I mean, we could do an Old Testament one uh, in between. I mean, do it like now and then do Luke Acts or something like that if you want to do an Old Testament. A minor prophet or a major prophet. Oh. Right. That sounds like a great idea. Okay. Well, if we were going to do something do from the Leviticus. Old Let's do Leviticus. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh, well, let's start. Let's start in Genesis from the beginning. <laughs> well, that's what I was thinking. Genesis. My is a great book. It really is. Yeah. I mean, Genesis provides the beginning story. I mean, it it lays out the whole groundwork, right? And, and sometimes you need to go back to the beginning. You know Amen. what I mean? Amen. Go back to the basic. Well, without Genesis, it, you know, yeah, we don't. You know, everything else builds yep. on that. Yeah. That was amazing. Starting from Genesis. Well, let's do Genesis and then we'll do Luke and Acts. Sound good? Perfect. I'm me. I'll be a couple of years from now. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, it, hey, we we got time. If Jesus Listen, wants to come uh, back, John, fine. John Piper. John Piper <laughs> spent ten years in the Book of Romans, verse by verse. Amen. Well, it's like people go, "When are we going to finish up this book?" Well, what are we going to do when we finish it up? We're going to start another one. So it's different. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I like I like just our interaction together because I mean that's what it's all about. Is that's how we learn best is in it together. Okay. You know, I was uh, I was listening to a, uh, a Steve Lawson from his he's a teacher. Yeah. League of he's good. Yeah. And he said something I never heard that before. You know, it makes a lot of sense. He said, "Okay, the first man was made in God's image." Amen. But up to that, the rest of the men was they were made in a, a, a man's image. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I know mean, you gotta take that. You gotta take that in context, of yeah, course. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You gotta take that in context. By the way, he put. I said, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. And it's good because remember, now you have a phony man. Yeah. So, well, the that man. Now it was not, you know, the, uh, according to the first one. Right. And, and I think that's what Paul brings out in Romans when he talks about the first and the second Adam. Yes. See, that's where now in Christ Jesus, we become God's image through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, and I think we lost that when we sinned in the garden. Yeah. And mind you going back again to Genesis when God talked to Adam one to one. Oh, beautiful. 
Can you imagine that? Oh man, that's. I'll tell you what. I I I I've only read it in Genesis, but I miss that. You know, just being there with him. I I I'm even envious of the disciples having been with Jesus personally. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, you know. But I still have him. I mean, I know I have a relationship with him, and he's with me every day. But man, wouldn't that been awesome just to be with him every day, all the time? Wow. And we will uh, be. I want. I think I read one of the book from the Bible Instrument, a uh, hand kind of graph. Uh huh. Uh huh. And uh, one thing he says in that book is that we lost the splendor of God, like that shine yeah. is that shine is supposed Agreed. to come out of us. Yeah. We lost it. But you yeah. know what? When sad. we get a glorified body, we're gonna get that again. Exactly. Isn't that sad? I mean, man, we had it all. And all because of one fruit and one blasted serpent. <laughs> Can you imagine how Adam and Eve must have felt when they lost that? Oh man. The rest of their yeah. life they got I mean, if we think we beat ourselves up. Yeah. Good <laughs> point. You know, they Good probably point. beat themselves up. For the next, well, how many years did they live? Like 900 years? Yeah. <laughs> long time to beat yourself up. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yep. Oh, oh, my oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay, then. We'll go into Genesis. And once we finish Genesis, Lord willing, we'll do Luke and Acts. Okay. Any prayer items? I've got, um, Lynn had given me uh, a prayer request from David. Because apparently he's been having some blood coming out of his ear. That Ooh. that doesn't sound good. No. So we need to pray about that. And he, she just wanted us all to know that he misses us. And, uh, and of course, we miss him too. So we'll be praying about that as well. Anybody else have prayer items? I have a few. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Are you sure? Go ahead, Julie. Okay. Um, so the first one, my son have a court on Tuesday. Okay. The second one, my daughter, uh, we training with, uh, army. She got exposed again. So she's in quarantine. So she had to get tested again for COVID-19. Okay. So we're not sure what will happen, okay. but we hoping God she doesn't have it. Okay. Um, as well, lately I've been not feeling well and, um, I've been in a lot of pain, and other than that, I've been having a lot of abnormal testing. Okay. But I leave everything in God's control. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay, Martin? Yes, uh, uh, let's continue to pray for Pastor Youth. You know, his Amen. surgery is coming up on the 9th, which I believe is next Monday. Okay. Okay. Yep. Operation. Yeah. Amen to that. Anybody else? We'll be playing, praying for our nation and this election. Yep. Yes, because uh, for now on, it's going to be chaos, I think. Oh, I think so, too. I really think so, too. I don't think people are just going to say, okay, I concede. Everything's fine. Oh, no. They're already, <laughs> uh, they have a lawsuit going on in, 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 in Pennsylvania right now. Oh, man. That's one of them. Yeah, so, yeah, turn we'll pray. What's that, Victor? Turn out to be another Dewey and Truman. Uh, or another Bush and Gore issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Anybody else? Um, I, my sinuses got better, and then I went and took my water aerobics class yesterday, and then I started coughing yesterday afternoon. Okay. So, um, if you guys could just pray that, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to go back in the pool again. I thought it was really cold, but uh, anyway, um, I guess that my body's going, no, you're not going to swim in freezing cold water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Listen to so, your body. Um, I, you know, everybody's going, come on. You know, everybody was like, you know, um, egging me to. Yeah, don't wimp me. out. Don't wimp <laughs> out. Come on in. Yeah. And I got in and I literally, I had to, I had to stay moving the whole time because I was, it was really cold. Oh, okay. And so um, then I got home yesterday, I started feeling really tired and um, I started coughing. So um, I just, um, it's, it's my sinuses. But anyway, um, if you just pray that yeah, God absolutely. would heal that because, you know, I have to, 
I have to work and I can't work if I'm coughing. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so not this, not with this COVID stuff going on. I can't, you know, exactly. so just pray to heal my uh, sinuses and my lungs. You got it. And praise the Lord. My mom is doing really great on the new medication. Sweet, she said she hasn't got this good in three months. So praise that's good. Praise God. Hey, Margaret, I saw your mouth moving, but you were muted, so I don't know if you had a prayer request. I was saying you need to continue praying for Pastor David's upcoming surgery for okay. the removal of the brain tumor that he'd been joking about. Right, right. Amen. Amen. Yes, that's that's two on that one. So, Lord, we're going to double up on Dr. Youth, Pastor Youth. <laughs> Amen. 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 He said yeah. last Sunday while he said last Sunday while they got it open, maybe they can stuff some good stuff in there. <laughs> What's that, Martin? I, I was saying, I know you mentioned about policy, but let's pray for the nation that you know uh, a lot of people are disappointed. Oh yeah, and uh, I guess another uh, the the other side is happy, uh, but uh, that we don't get a lot of violence out there because we don't know how things are going to go. To be honest, agreed, agreed. You got it. Okay, let's pray then. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've been with us. Boy, we've spent quite a bit of time here on First and Second Corinthians, but Lord, it's it's been great. I mean, I think it's shown a lot that we need to be focused on, but mainly that we need to keep our eyes on you, Lord, and that we need to come together as the body of Christ in a unity that brings honor and glory to you and that just upholds you as the head and of, of the body. So Lord, we ask that you just continue to work in us to make us more like you, dear Holy Spirit, you know, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would be more like Christ in everything that we do, that we would reflect you in our unity and in our love toward one another. And Lord, we just pray that you continue to develop us. That's why we're studying your word, Lord, because we want to just know you better. And we want to obey your commands because we do love you, Lord. And we want, you know, we don't want to look like the world as a bunch of Christians, but we want to look like you, Lord Jesus, as a bunch of Christians, united together. So be with us, Lord, and thank you for this great study in the books of Corinthians, or in the letters of Corinthians by Paul. And Lord, as we move on to Genesis, I pray that you would just continue to build us up and show us your wonder and how you started everything, Lord, and that we can trust you, that you're in control no matter what. And we thank you for that, Lord. Now, Lord, we pray for David. Uh, you know what's causing his bleeding from his ear, Lord. Um, I imagine he's going to have to go into the hospital to have that looked at. I pray that you give wisdom and insight to the doctors so that they can easily isolate whatever the issue is that's causing that bleeding. And we pray that it not be anything serious, Lord. Just put your hand on him. And also give him peace. I know David would love to be united here with us together. He wants to be in the class, but unfortunately right now that's just not happening. So we pray that you give him peace and just let him know that we love him and we're praying for him. And we want the best for him, Lord. I pray for Julie. And, you know, she's not been feeling well. You know the, the matters that she's dealing with and her illnesses and whatnot, Lord. I pray you put your hand on her. But above all, give her peace, Lord. Give her your peace as she's dealing with this matter. And give her, you know, just let her put your healing hand on her, Lord. That's what I ask is that you would just take away her pain, Lord, and give her peace. I also pray for Van Julier as he's going into court on Tuesday. Lord, we, again, we just lift him up and ask that you be in control. You are a God of justice. And we pray that justice in its right way will be carried out and that your will will be done, Lord. And because your will and your justice is always right. And so we look to you, Lord, and we pray for that court issue. We also pray for uh, you know, Julie's daughter and the army, you know, she was exposed as, hey, I've been once and thank God I didn't, I didn't catch the virus, but 
Lord, she's going to get tested. I pray that she didn't catch whatever she was exposed to, Lord, if, and that you would keep her safe and that she would be fine, Lord. We look to you, Lord, and we trust you because right now this is a crazy time when you just don't know who you're coming in contact with these days and if they are well or not well. In many cases, many of them may, may carry the virus and not even know it. So, I mean, it's a crazy time, Lord, and who knows, maybe we're carrying the virus and don't even know it. So we keep our eyes on you, Lord, because we trust you in the midst of all this uncertainty, because you're the only stabilizing factor that we have. So we look to you, Lord, and we ask for your peace through it all. As both Martin and uh, Margaret prayed, Lord, we're, we lift up Pastor Youth to you, Lord, who's going into his operation on the night to get that mass uh, removed from his brain, the mass that's not supposed to be there. And so we ask you, Lord, that you give, you know, just like you took care of him through his heart operation and, and his recovery through, you know, falling on the bicycle and breaking rib and all that, that just as you were with him there and had him recover to where he's almost back to 100%, we ask you, Lord, that you just also do the same with this operation and his recovery therewith. Because our eyes are on you, Lord. We can't do anything. So we have to look to you. You are our purpose, our strength. And so that's why we look to you, Lord, because you are able. And you are God, Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. And so we look to you for that, Lord, I pray. Now, Lord, I also pray for uh, this nation. Man, you know... Uh, Elections can always be something that really polarize the nation. And Lord, we're not looking for, you know, a bunch of unrest and, and issues that don't bring peace in our nation. So Lord, I pray, Lord God, that whoever it is that you have to sit in the chair will, will do so in a way that is, I guess, peaceful and i mean even if it's not the person that maybe we voted for the issue is is that the the matter will be implemented in a peaceful way because i mean the person wouldn't be sitting in the chair if it's not somebody you didn't want there lord because you're still soft you're still in control and you know our nation deserves the person that you put in the chair so but let us always at least for us the christians let us keep our eyes on you lord and trust you regardless of what that is, what the outcome is, because, hey, we're here to serve you, Lord, and you tell us to be at peace with all men, and also to obey those that are put in that leadership position, as long as it doesn't go against your word and your scripture, and doesn't call us to somehow deny you, then we are to obey, we are to be at peace with them, so Lord, I pray for those that don't know you, and that are, and even those that do, but are really polarized or really politically oriented, that you would just give people peace in the process. And that this matter would just, you know, uh, resolve itself peacefully, regardless of who ends up winning. Whether it's President Trump and he remains in power, or whether it's a uh, uh, president, or uh, I guess uh, the contender, uh, pre uh, yeah, Biden, uh, and, and it's he who you decide that will be in the chair. Whoever it is, Lord, I just pray that there be peace in the nation, and we look to you through it all, Lord. I also pray for my sister Donna. Lord, you know she's been dealing with this issue ever since she went to go visit her mom at the hospital, that she's been having, you know, some cough and some breathing issues and uh and sinus issues that got exacerbated because of some of the cleaning fluids or stuff that they had at the hospital. But Lord, you know what's going on there. I pray that you put your healing hand on her and that you resolve the matter, you know, so that she can just, you know, have, have, you know, live her life normally without having to worry about these coughs, this breathing, the sinus issues and whatnot. You're Jehovah Rapha and we claim her healing just as you, you have promised you can do and you've demonstrated that you can do, we trust you as Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. And we claim that, Lord, together. And we agree that that's what you will do. So we praise you for that. 
Also, we want to praise you, Lord, for how well her, her mom has been able to react to this newest medication and how it has been working well for her, and she's been doing fine. Thank you for that, Lord. You're awesome. And we praise you for it, Lord, and give you all the honor and the glory. I know there are other prayer requests that people haven't mentioned that we lift up to you too, whether it's in our families, whether it's at a national level, whether it's at a governmental level, whatever it may be. We look to you, Lord, and we trust you in and through it all, because in the end, you're sovereign, Lord. No matter what governments, no matter what leaders are in place, you still are in control. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We keep our eyes on you and we trust you in and through it all. And let us reflect you in the midst of all of those we come in contact with so that you, Lord God, get the honor and the glory. Now, as we go, I pray that you go with us and keep us safe. Let us daily keep our eyes on you and devote ourselves to following you in a way that honors and glorifies you and that brings us, the body of Christ, closer together in unity, reflecting you by our love. We thank you and we praise you. We give you all the honor and the glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Oh, P.S. We need to pray for um, Irene's complete healing from the uh, the attorney. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the attorney that had the uh, stroke. We need for to her stroke, yeah. To agree, according to Matthew 18, 19, that she will get better because the yep. court date's Tuesday. Is she going to be able to be at the court, Julie? We're not sure okay. at this moment. What's going to happen? Is, is somebody else going to go for her or are they going to um, reschedule it? We know. Until now, she hasn't said anything, but apparently she will show up like that. Okay. Oh, well, okay. well, Lord, we pray for uh, Irene. And you know mm -hmm. what she's dealing with, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. the uh, stroke and her recovery and what abilities and capabilities she has. You know the court date that's coming up. You know that uh, we prayed about for Van Julier, about little Isabella, and you know that matter that's going on. We pray for Van Julier's ex-wife, Lord, that you would work in her heart, change her heart, Lord, because there's no future, you know, in, in witchcraft or anything like that. But in you, there is eternal life. So, Lord, I pray for her that you would just, you know, work in her heart. But more than anything, Lord, just Put your hand on Irene and, and make her capable, able to be able to do this court uh, hearing and, and just heal her, Lord. We agree that you are God, our healer. So we trust you in and through it all. And we praise you that you will do what brings, you know, what is the most just thing to do because we trust in your justice, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know what? That might turn out to be a blessing because when she walks into court after having a stroke, that other attorney is not going to be able to attack her like a bulldog. Well, I the think they're doing it virtually, right? Yes. Whatever yes. The, but whatever yeah, the deal is, if she shows up when they know she's had a stroke and right, been through right. surgery and everything, the judge might just kind of... Show compassion. Yeah. yeah, I just think that maybe God... God's, you know, well, God's got this anyway, but, you know, this may be God's way of, of um, letting this whole thing, you know, I don't know. I just, that was the first thing that I was thinking when we were praying that she's still mm -hmm. going to go that, you know, maybe, maybe this will be what uh, the mercy that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, we keep our eyes on the Lord, right? Yeah. Right. Amen. So. Amen. And they show now that the, the S wife, is putting excuses saying that, oh, she might have cancer and all of this from nowhere, uh, close, close to court. What right, a convenience. Right. Who, who, has, who has cancer? The ex-wife? No, the ex-wife saying now that she might have cancer. But what a convenience saying it close to court. Yeah. So we don't know if it's even true. <laughs> Well, yeah. the thing that is, is that if she, if it's not true, whatever, God can take that and turn it around and go, well, if you have cancer, then you might not be able to take care of your daughter. You know, she might need yeah. to be with, you know, her father who might be, you know, in a situation. Yeah. So, you know, we're just going to right now in the name the of Lord. Jesus, Amen. we just pray that every curse that this, that this ex-wife comes up with is going to bounce off and fly right back to her like a boomerang. And we just trust you. Lord, Amen. 
in Jesus' name. We trust the Lord. Amen. Lord. Yes. Yes, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna pray that that she will that whatever happens, no weapon formed against uh, your son will prosper, and that um, that this will that that whatever the enemy does for his harm will be for his good because God's going to work it all together for good, just like he did with Joseph. And like Romans 828 says, we're just trusting that in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. What's the ex-wife's name? So I can pray for her by name. Mercedes. Okay. Like the automobile. Yeah. 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 (coughs) Yeah, Yes. Well, we're just trusting that God's got it. All. God's got this. God's Amen. got this. Yes. Amen. Is. Well, good night, everybody. Okay. Good night. Good night, everybody. It's been great. And Thanks, we'll Ken. be in Genesis next yeah. week. Amen. Good night. Amen. Amen. Good night, Martin. Thank Thanks, you. brother, for all your input. Give our love to Wendy. Thank you. Good night. You got it, brother. Good night. Howdy. Good day. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Take care, Julie. And God bless you. Glad to see your house is looking a lot better. Praise the Lord. Thank and and you. Isabelita, it was great seeing her and Van Julia. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Hey, Van. Take care, my brother. God bless yeah. you all. Thank Bye-bye. You. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night, Margaret. You take care, night, young lady. And we'll see you Saturday afternoon. You got it. The and, final story of hope. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, good night to you then, Margaret. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you.